Welcome everybody to our uh, ALS uh, conference on defending democracy. I'm just so so pleased that you are here. Um, I am uh, Mark Alexander, uh, Dean at Villanova University, Charles Widger School of Law, and the president of the Association of American Law Schools. Um, and as um, many of you may know, um, this year, uh, the theme I have uh, chosen for uh, my presidency is defending democracy. I had the uh, opportunity to speak about it in uh, some length at our annual meeting in San Diego in January. And um, the idea is that throughout this year, we'll be talking about um, how we as law professors and law schools can um, defend democracy. And um, that will be you know, ongoing work, frankly, I hope not just this one year. Um, and the uh, next year's annual meeting, which will be in Washington, D.C., um, that will be the theme for the annual meeting itself. Um, so, you know, I've had the opportunity to uh, make that the theme, but also um, wanted to follow up on uh, work we did last year, actually, <clears throat> in discussing this, this topic and um, do a, a conference to discuss uh, the importance of defending democracy. So I am really uh, grateful that we have this opportunity to gather. Uh, up front, I also want to, um, in advance, thank everybody for uh, for being here. We've got a, a great group of of speakers who will be presenting uh, today. Um, you know, I, I will be moving to our first panel in a few minutes, um, which will uh, have Dean Kevin Johnson, Dean Kim Mutcherson, and Dean Andy Perlman. Um, after a lunch break, I guess lunch break for those of us on the East Coast, maybe coffee if you're on the West Coast, and maybe a little of both if you are. Um, in mountain time zone or central zones, but um, we'll have a lunch break, but then we'll have a panel on uh, democracy in the state of law school education with Dean Danielle Conway, uh, Dean Anthony Crowell, uh, Professor uh, Kate Shaw and Dean Dan Takaji. And then the last panel will be on election law and democracy with Professor uh, Guy Charles and uh, Professor Fernita Tolson and um, Commissioner Ellen Weintraub from the Federal Election Commission and uh, moderated by Professor uh, Justin Levitt. Um, so we've got just wonderful people who have committed to this. Um, so I'm really thinking it's 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 gonna be a wonderful uh, conference itself. Um, I want to also up front um, give great thanks to everybody at ALS. Uh, I am uh, personally grateful to all the support that I get from the entire staff. Um, I'm really grateful for um, the leadership of Judy Areen, who is an extraordinary executive director of our organization. Um, this. Uh, conference itself has come together um, with so many folks pulling it together. Um, special thanks to Tracy Thomas um, and also on the Villanova Law and special thanks to my assistant, Mandy Goins. Um, so it's been a lot of hands pulling this together and I'm quite uh, quite pleased to, to be able to welcome everybody here today to this. So um, with that said, um, I would like to move into our first panel um, and the the first panel is uh, called Beyond Imagination, the State of the Union Three Years Later. Now, it's not quite three years, um, but it's three years after January 6th is the, the reference. So let me uh, set up this panel, and we've got um, three great uh, panelists to talk about, to talk about this subject. Um, if we go back to January 6th, um, 2021, I guess two and a half years ago, um, we all, you know, we all witnessed the uh, assault on the Capitol, uh, the insurrection that it was certainly one of the uh, low points in uh, our our country to see folks uh, uh, invading the Capitol, destroying the Capitol, um, defecating in the halls of the Capitol, um, killing um, individuals. Um, such a such a day. Um, at that um, Im immediately afterwards. Uh, we law school deans gathered together and um, came together for a uh, a letter that was signed by about three quarters of us. Um, I think even more than that now. I think about the numbers, but and it's it's rare that you can get all law school deans to agree on anything. Um, but we were very strong in our agreement that this is something where we need to speak out about our role um, in in our country, thinking about what we do as those who are training lawyers for the future. Um, training folks to defend the uh, rule of law, to respect the rule of law. Um, and we thought we had to speak out. 
so there's a, a letter that w- that we sent, which uh, it, it spurred in my mind, uh, the, the conversations, frankly, spurred in my mind a thought. And that thought was, you know, the letter is great. And I wonder what else we can do. And so I had this idea and I sent an email out to a bunch of my colleagues, other deans, other schools. And I said, hey, maybe we could write a book about this. Somehow we could each comment. Because when we when we were talking about this as deans, we would talk from our perspectives as leaders of our individual law schools, certainly, but also as lawyers with uh, you know commitment to country, but also as professors, subject matter experts. And so we each had, I thought, very interesting perspectives to, to add to this debate. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could just talk with lots of folks about our perspectives? Um, and so uh, I sent an email out and I got a very strong response from my colleagues who said, yeah, I'd be in for this. And so we set about a project uh, in uh, breakneck pace where we uh, became a group the, the group actually grew and shrank and grew and shrank during the process. Some who could be involved at first, then could not be. Some who jumped in later. Um, but it turned out to be a, um, that we we wrote a book. Um, the book is called Beyond Imagination. Um, boom, there it is. We'll have a link to it. Um, yep, yeah, actually, it's in the chat now. Um, and so, um, y- you know, the reason we call it Beyond Imagination, one of the times we were having a, a group call on this is we we were saying, well, what do we call this book? And we thought beyond imagination, but it's beyond imagination with a question mark. You know, was it beyond imagination? Should it be beyond imagination? Is it really beyond imagination? So we're look, we were looking at the, uh, the January 6th insurrection, and we're each writing our own thoughts about what this means in relation to our own roles as uh, law school deans, but again, also as subject matter experts. And so um, we had just a, a terrific uh, group of folks. And, and actually, if you if you go to that link, you'll be able just to, to see all the authors. Um, and so I, I thought for today, it would be good to say, uh, as we think about defending democracy, to ask ourselves a question, like, how are we doing? How are we doing since uh, the January 6th insurrection? And using the book as a vehicle for this conversation. Um, you know, the, you could certainly engage any of the authors in this kind of conversation. Um, you know, honestly, every chapter was the work of the individual. Um, we all were collaborating and, and reviewing and editing. That was one of my great joys to see these chapters as they came in. Um, but it's just our own individual perspectives on what happened. I didn't say to everybody, this must be the, the topic you write about. I didn't say this must be the perspective you take. Um, but it was just our perspectives on on such a tragic day in our in our nation's history. So to kick off this uh, this conference today, I thought let's you know let's get a get the band back together, um, at least get a few members together. Um, and uh, we actually did a a discussion um, at the the um, not this past annual meeting, but the one before that. Um, the book actually came out on January sixth, twenty twenty two. Um, we we the release date was a year after the insurrection itself, and we did a um, we did a panel at the ALS annual meeting, which was virtual in 2022, um, where we got the entire group together. And so we've got four of us together today um, to talk about um, where we are since uh, January 6th. Um, and um, you know, quite quite pleased um, to welcome um, my colleagues, my friends, my co-authors. Um, Dean Kevin Johnson uh, from UC Davis. We have Dean Kim Mutcherson from uh, Rutgers, and we have uh, Dean Andy Perlman from Suffolk. Um, it's just wonderful folks to have on. Um, and and so what we're going to do is is I will just uh, ask each one to to speak for a few minutes. Um, first, just a quick perspective on sort of what was your chapter, um, and then you know, putting that in context of, of where are we a few years later. <clears throat> um, I will a- actually ask, we'll, we'll go with, with, um, with Kevin first. I will, um, uh, I will also, I guess I'll pitch in my own thoughts after the, the, the three go, I will then talk about my, my chapter. Um, so after we each do a little introduction, um, we'll have a conversation about, 
um, you know, some some follow up questions on on where things are going. So um, I'll, I'll pass it over to you, uh, to Kevin, for uh, for a couple couple minutes of of your own perspectives from your chapter. Hey, th thanks, Mark, and uh, and thanks for organizing this panel, organizing the book, uh, and thanks the ALS for for putting this program together. Uh, my, my contribution to Beyond Imagination. Uh, tried to make sense out of what law schools could do in the wake of January 6th. And I want to start off by saying I found January 6th to be an incredibly perplexing event. Uh, in fact, uh, I was just talking last week at a diversity professionals conference. Uh, on the afternoon of January 6th, uh, I was being called on, like many law school deans probably were, to make some kind of statement about what was going on. Uh, and I, I had a hard time knowing what was going on and thinking of what I might say in a statement that was somehow uplifting in some kind of way, as opposed to saying something like, we're doomed and it's all over. Uh, and I waited uh, till the next morning uh, to make a statement. And I think I could, made a more positive one about how, uh, you know, calm had been restored, you know, the, 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 the um, uh, legal process would take its um, um, actions as necessary. And it could be a little more uplifting and inspiring because I didn't want to make a statement at a time that could be pessimistic and, and, and doom setting. Um, but as I, I thought about the day later, and as I wrote about it for, for the, the book, uh, uh, I think that what happened reminded us about the value of legal education and what law schools do best. That is teaching students um, to um, marshal facts, uh, to apply the law, uh, and to uh, cherish, in important ways, the rule of law. Uh, and the truth is, long before January 6th, uh, the Trump administration had put into question all these sort of core values about looking at the facts carefully, marshaling the law, uh, and applying them the law is, is appropriate. Uh, and so in my mind, it wasn't just January 6th, but the entire administration that re reinforced the fundamental nature of legal education in a democratic society. Um, and let me offer a little bit of, of, of flavor to that. Um, repeatedly, we saw an administration dismissing the facts uh, and ignoring the law. Uh, we all sat in disbelief on January 6th as that became uh, a culmination of, of several years of that. Um, but if you look at, you know, uh, at, at, at previous history, you see that, you know, that very similar things were done. Um, um, facts were exaggerated, if not um, manufactured. Uh, we, we heard about the record setting numbers of people at, at our inauguration day. Uh, and then we heard uh, not long before January 6th uh, that um, the 2020 election had been stolen. In fact, those were President Trump's words uh, and violence broke out shortly after that. Uh, now, some viewed the violence as an attempted coup. Um, I do think it's worth emphasizing, and, and I think I'll be talking about this in the, in the Q&A, that as we know from the new, know from the news coverage, uh, many participants in the violence were white supremacists. Um, that's no surprise, really, because racism uh, and anti-minority sentiment was an undercurrent to the entire Trump presidency, and it's part of its legacy. In fact, I think that legacy continues on today with the attacks um, that have really metastasized uh, on critical race theory. Um, now, we, we all know that the, the events of January 6th, um, culminating uh, a number of years of assault on our legal institution, affected uh, law school students and faculty. Applicants uh, saw the Trump administration uh, for what it was, and we saw an early increase in applications uh, that some attributed to the Trump bump. Uh, and many law school applicants expressed interest in, in learning about civil rights. Um, law faculty have paid a great deal of attention to, to the Trump administration's approach to, to law and policy. One of my colleagues at UC Davis, she, she released a podcast um, uh, with a professional podcaster that was called What Trump Can Teach Us About Con Law. 
Uh, and she ended up putting that together in part because uh, every morning when she'd read something in the paper, she knew that her con law students would be asking about what was going on. Uh, um, I, I teach immigration law and write about immigration. Uh, and the Trump administration gave constant fodder to, to um, discussions about uh, the relevance of law or lack of relevance. And in many ways, the Trump administration relied on racial passions, uh, not law or policy uh, to motivate its, its, its um, immigration measures. You can look at the infamous policy of separating migrant children from their parents that in effect is lawless, as well as the remain in Mexico policy returning asylum applicants to Mexico, uh, which, which runs afoul of international law. Um, same is true for the Muslim ban. Uh, and, and we saw many people understanding the ramifications of that ban, uh, including students and faculty from across the country who provided assistance at airports to Muslims caught up in, in, the, in the dragnet. Um, now, I, I, I do fear um, that uh, there's a much more subtle uh, implication uh, of the the Trump administration's approach to law and policy than those sort of blatantly racist acts. Um, his administration really put into question the basics of legal analysis and really the core of legal education. Um, the administration offer, often offered alternative facts uh, and disdained the law and courts, denigrating the law and the courts in, in many different ways. Um, careful treatment of the facts and application of the law, of course, is what we do at law schools. And it's something that was basically made fun of by, by many in the Trump administration. And they simply did not rely on the facts or the law to motivate policy. Uh, you can think of some of the alternative facts like the counterfactual story, the stolen election, uh, the record setting attendance and inauguration, the characterization of immigrants as criminals and welfare abusers, just to give you a, a few, few examples. Uh, and as I mentioned, all too often, the administration didn't rely on facts and law, but passions to dominate policymaking. Um, you can think of all kinds of examples, including referring to Mexicans as criminals and rapists, and Haiti and El Salvador as S-hole countries that didn't, shouldn't have its nationals coming to the United States. And I think you know, we, we also can look uh, at the Trump administration's treatment of um, um, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, rather than saying that we should think about systemic racial injustice, uh, like that that dominated the headlines in 2020, we saw uh, the Trump administration denigrate the Black Lives Matter movement and take extraordinary stamp, steps to stamp out protest. Um, the U.S. military uh, being deployed in the streets of Washington, D.C. are one example. The use of the Department of Homeland Security in P Portland, Oregon, and in Oakland, California are other examples. Uh, and unlike any other administration in modern history, the Trump administration pushed the law to the legal limits, if not far beyond. Even the Supreme Court not infrequently rejected the Trump administration's positions. One example is the, uh, the, the Bureau of the Census case, Department of Commerce case, involving the citizenship question on the 2020 census, uh, which as it turned out when documents were revealed was nothing less than a partisan attempt to, to uh, dilute the democratic vote. Uh, I wanna end there, but I, I think in the end, uh, what I gather from January 6th, as well as four years uh, of the Trump administration uh, was the importance of what we do in law schools, teaching law students to marshal the facts, not make up facts, not manufacture facts, and to rigorously apply the law to the facts. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kevin. And um, by the way, you know, I'm, you know, in the chat room, we've got um, the links to each of these individuals and all their extraordinary credentials. So I'm not even uh, doing long intros for any of them. Um, so I, I want to make clear that I think they are great and um, I'll leave, leave the time for them to, to speak about their work, um, but you can look them up um, online. 
Um, before I turn to Kim Mutcherson, um, breaking uh, news that just came in is that Henry Enrique Tario and three other Proud Boys were just found guilty of seditious conspiracy in the January 6th attack. Um, you know, it's I obviously could not have planned that, um, but it was just, uh, I guess it was just, the verdict was just uh, announced um, a few minutes ago. Um, and, you know, that's just the point of what we're doing here. We're asking, what have we learned, um, you know, in these 850 days or so since since that time? And um, one thing is that we, we are seeing that some individuals are uh, being held accountable um, under the law. Um, some may and some may not be. That's, I think, a, an interesting thing that we are we are dealing with at this very moment um, with this breaking news. Um, so um, just wanted to mention that to folks that has just happened. And we can maybe even weave that into our discussion after um, this this round of the sort of introductory comments. Um, so now I'll turn to Kim Utcherson. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, thanks for organizing us both for putting the book together um, and then also for um, being here today together. And thanks, Kevin, for um, starting us off um, so well. Uh, so my chapter um, for the book is called The Color Line, Democracy, Race, and the January 6th Insurrection. Um, and I did something that I um, literally almost never do, um, which is reread my own published writing um, <laughs> in preparation for um, our discussion today. And I, I actually really like this essay, so I'm glad that I that I put it together. Um, and so just as the title suggests, what I was really thinking about when I was writing my chapter um, was really about both the, as, as Kevin pointed out, the white supremacy that was at the root of a lot of what went on in January 6th and what has gone on um, since then, um, as well as thinking really about the um, really problematic role that lawyers played um, in a lot of what happened. So lawyers who were involved in filing lawsuits that shouldn't have been filed, um, challenging the election, lawyers in uh, the Senate, Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, um, who were you know, out there sort of rallying the troops behind the lie um, of the election. And so I wanted to really focus on law schools um, and what we owe to our students in terms of helping them not grow up to be people um, who are attacking the Capitol or encouraging people to attack the Capitol. Um, when we should be focused on and upholding the rule of law. Um, I should also say in this context that as I was writing my chapter, and of course, as we all live through January 6th, um, we were also living through um, the, the uh, all that had happened post the murder of George Floyd. And so at my law school and lots of other law schools, there were, we were already having um, significant conversations about what we taught our students, how we taught, how we taught um, our students, our expectations for ourselves individually as people who were um, really charged with educating some of the folks who will be those future leaders, who will be those people who are sitting in Congress, who will be those people um, who are judges, who will be those people at those law firms who have to decide, am I going to participate in this kind of um, activity? And we have been talking really deeply about changes that we wanted to make to um, our curriculum and recognizing that our students, and at Rutgers, we teach a lot of first-gen students, but we teach a whole range of folks, really, um, as a state university. But students come to us from a real variety of settings, and they haven't necessarily um, been given the tools that I think are really necessary to be the kind of critical thinkers that we're trying to create in law school. Um, and one of those tools is understanding, and this seems so obvious, and yet I, I say it to students all the time, um, that law is never created in a vacuum, um, and that law is not handed down to us on tablets, right? All of these things are being made and constructed um, by people and people who often have had um, biases, people who often have been problematic in a whole range of different ways. And so if all that we do is teach our students black letter law, we are doing a deep disservice to them. And frankly, I think doing a deep disservice to democracy and a deep disservice um, to, uh, to our country. And I just want to give you um, an example of that. So one of the things that we did 
um, after, uh, as part of the work that we were doing in the law school um, after George Floyd's murder and talking about, you know, how do we ensure that we are an anti-racist institution, we created an elective class for our first year law students called Law and Inequality. Um, and basically law and inequality has a colon and then whatever your particular area of expertise is as the professor, that's the context in which you are teaching about law and inequality. So my section of law and inequality, which I've now taught for two years to our first year students, um, is called law and inequality uh, reproductive justice, which is the work that I do um, as a scholar. And I've been surprised, and, and, and not just in this course, but in other courses that I have taught where I am working on similar themes, at the number of times I am teaching history of this country um, and history of the way that law has been constructed in this country, that my students, who are all adults, um, who've gone to college, um, have never heard before, right? So I talk to them about for sterilizations about Black women in the South. I tell them about the Rell sisters, two young Black girls, 14 and 12, um, who were sterilized um, down in Alabama. Um, I talk about the sterilizations of Chicana women um, in Los Angeles, right? This, this whole sort of apparatus um, that allowed for incredible abuse of, of Black and Brown women. Um, I talk to them about Native American boarding schools, which so many of them have no sense of that. Um, as part of the history of this country and what it means to rip people from their families of origin in order to, um, as this, as the saying was, um, kill the Indian and save the man. I talked to them about um, the Chinese Exclusion Act also as a part of a history of reproductive justice in this country, because part of what was happening there wasn't just about keeping um, Chinese people from immigrating, it was about keeping uh, Chinese women from coming and being able to be married to the Chinese men who had already been brought here to work on the railroads and to create babies who would be American citizens um, who would be of Chinese origin. And so many of them have never heard those stories before and don't and, and as a consequence of that, um, don't have an understanding of sort of how we got to where we are um, and what we can do about it. And I would say that in the time period between when we when I wrote my my chapter and where we are now, that in lots of ways, the world has actually gotten worse. Um, so sort of think about, you know, the book bans that we are seeing um, across the country. Um, certainly at the time that I was writing, we were seeing some of those initial attacks on critical race theory, um, which almost everybody who is criticizing it has absolutely no idea what it is. Um, um, <clears throat> laws that are keeping teachers um, from being able to teach on subjects that will um, make, make students feel uncomfortable or feel distressed in their classrooms. And we should, of course, recognize that students should have the word white um, in front of it, because that's really what we're talking about here. Um, and so from my perspective, as I wrote my chapter, I was thinking about what I what our students deserve. And our students obviously deserve our best, which means creating brave spaces in our law schools, not safe spaces, but brave spaces, because um, I think some of the most important learning that our students experience is when there is discomfort, um, when they are confronted um, with facts, when they are confronted with the uh, ways in which our experiences as Americans um, are, are deeply disparate, and that those disparate experiences are often rooted um, in categories of identity. So I wanted to um, finish up actually by reading um, a, a passage from my from my um, contribution to the book. So um, like a lot of my colleagues, I'm sure I wrote a, a, an email to the law school community um, after January 6th. Um, and I included part of that in the chapter um, that I wrote for this book. And I just want to read that because I think it um, it provides both a sort of sense of, of where I was then, um, but also I think is really relevant to where we are now. So what I wrote was, I cannot do anything about the chaos at the Capitol building today, but I can choose how to respond to what I saw. And right now I choose to focus on how this day began. After his victory, Senator-elect Warnock paid, paid homage to his mother, Verlene, who raised him and his 11 siblings. He said, quote, because this is America, the 82-year-old hands that used to pick somebody else's cotton went to the polls and picked her youngest son to be a United States senator, end quote. This is the America that I celebrate tonight. There will be plenty of time tomorrow and in the days, weeks, and months to come, which is 
turned out to be true, um, to deconstruct today's raw display of unpatriotic, undemocratic, and criminal behavior. Until then, I'll continue to think about what we do as lawyers to uphold the rule of law, whether it's Stacey Abrams fighting voter suppression in Georgia, the judges who carefully considered and then rejected lawsuits attempting to overturn the election results, or the many lawyers in Congress who went back to work as soon as they were told that it was safe to do so. This country is so much more than one man in the White House or a group of his disaffected supporters. I remain confident that our future is bright and, you, and that you are all a part of what makes it so. And I continue to think that, um, that what we do as law school deans, what we do as law school professors um, is so incredibly critical to the lawyers, of course, that our, that our students um, will become. And that part of what we must do is teach them to be critical consumers of the law from the moment that they walk into our classrooms. And I hope that that is something that we're all committed to um, and that we are churning out the kinds of lawyers who help build the America that we want to live in. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Kim. And uh, now I'll move it over to Andy Perlman. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, very tough acts to follow, uh, following Kevin and Kim. But let me start with a thank you to you for your leadership, both of AALS and the issues that we're talking about today. I remain in awe two years later that you were able to assemble a group of deans who have somewhat busy schedules and have us write chapters for a book in a matter of a few months. It was truly a remarkable effort. And I think our willingness to do it speaks volumes about our respect for you, but also how seriously uh, we take the issues uh, that we're talking about at today's conference. So regarding my chapter, I thought I'd put it into a little bit of context, uh, start fairly narrowly on a matter of legal ethics that I talked about uh, in my chapter, and then uh, talk a little bit more generally about where I see us today. So as I think about the prospects of our democracy, and I look historically, both in the U.S. and around the world, it's a little hard to escape two simultaneous and to some extent conflicting realities as it relates to lawyers. First, if you look throughout history, the legal profession has contributed to, I think we might all agree, are some of the world's greatest accomplishments when it comes to democratic progress. We've helped to establish democratic governments, written constitutions that protect human rights and, and generally ensured the proper functioning of numerous essential democratic institutions, including, but certainly not limited to an independent judiciary. But at the same time, as we understand these remarkable achievements that the legal profession has contributed to, we also know that throughout history, lawyers have contributed to a wide range of scandals and disgraces and horrific behavior, both while representing clients, and Kim alluded to this uh, in her remarks, but especially whilst serving in what I call in my chapter, non-representational public roles. And by that, I mean people who are elected officials and advisors to political leaders, but who are acting outside of the context of law practice. And just to take a few historic examples, uh, we know by way of illustration, lawyers played a significant role in Nazi Germany's development and implementation of the laws that led to the Holocaust. But within the US, lawyers have engaged in many instances of shameful behavior from Nixon, who was a lawyer, to the people who covered up uh, Watergate, who are lawyers, uh, to playing uh, a role in the codification of slavery in our constitution and the creation of Jim Crow laws. Lawyers played an important and critical part. So I think in short, the point here is that lawyer leaders from modern to historical have engaged in some pretty horrific behavior. And we know that uh, lawyers at the end of the day play a critical role in our democracy and the protection of essential rights that we all have, but they could also cause a lot of damage. So the basic question that I tried to grapple with in my chapter was basically this, what should we do as a profession, if anything, and I'll emphasize if anything, about the lawyers who lied about the 2020 presidential election, and particularly those lawyers, such as elected officials, who lied in their non-representational uh, public roles. And I'm, I'm gonna put up on the screen just a, a one slide that I think captures 
the, the hard question that I was trying to answer. Uh, what you can see along the top row is what you might call traditional legal ethics, this question of uh, how do we deal with misbehavior when lawyers are acting in a representational role. Um, and we have standard rules and procedures for dealing with that. Uh, we have the rules of professional conduct, we have rules of civil procedure, and the mechanism is grinding through lawyers who misbehaved in that representational role in the context of the 2020 election. People like Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani and John Eastman. So th that is pretty straightforward. It not terribly complicated or provocative. The bottom row is what really interested me. And it's this question of the conduct when lawyers are acting outside of their representational roles. And again, the, a great example here is legislators. And, and Kim alluded to them earlier, like a US senator who outright lies about what happened in the presidential election. When that behavior is unlawful, like somebody engaging in perjury or theft, we do have rules that govern that subject. And that's, uh, you can see that there. What I am, what I find particularly interesting and perhaps the most important box in this slide is the bottom right corner. And that is, what do we do when a lawyer who's acting in a non-representational public role engages in disgraceful behavior, but that's otherwise lawful, like First Amendment speech. Is there anything that we can or that we should be doing about it? So my chapter was really focused on that question. And although there is some scholarly disagreement, I take the position in my chapter that the rules don't currently allow for the discipline of these lawyers. And maybe even more provocatively, and we can get into a discussion if people want to go down this doctrinal rabbit hole, um, I think that the ethics rules shouldn't uh, try to discipline uh, lawyers in that corner of the chart. And I make a few different arguments in support of that view, because, uh, and one of them is that I think it would risk politicizing the legal ethics pro uh, process in ways that would ultimately undermine the profession's pro professional independence, and that plays such a critical role in upholding our democratic institutions. I think it will put the profession in the position of having to resolve the truth of many kinds of political disagreements in ways that are probably more harmful than beneficial to the profession's ability to do its work. Um, and to be clear, I, I'm not trying to argue that there isn't something that we can be doing. Kim actually alluded to a few possibilities. And we, uh, Mark already mentioned, and I think Kim did as well, the statement that uh, law school deans issued uh, after January 6th. We have a role to play in educating the next generation of lawyer leaders who will go on to serve in non-representative public roles. And I think maybe we need to do a better job on matters of civics, among other subjects. Law schools might consider collaborating on a variety of nonpartisan ways uh, to engage in reform, especially around election law. But at the end of the day, my take is that the behavior of the lawyers after and around January 6 reflects a much deeper and problematic series of issues that are not really related to legal ethics or legal education. They relate to issues like understanding the risks of the internet and social media, and now gener generative AI in the spread of misinformation and how that's only going to get a lot worse. Uh, our increasing inattention to issues of civics education, not just in law schools, but well before it, uh, and our failure to update our election laws to make sure that they are modern and dealing with the issues that we're facing today. I think we're making some progress on a few of these issues, but to answer Mark's initial question directly, I fear it's not enough. And that if you think about the the storm that we faced on January 6th uh, on, in 2021, I think we're in the eye of that storm right now. It feels peaceful, but I don't think it's the end of the storm. I think the back wall of that storm is yet to come through. How How much that shakes the foundations of our democracy is a little bit unclear. Uh, but I don't think the the worst of it has arrived. 
Um, and so that's a somewhat sobering way to end my, my comments. Uh, but I do think that we still have so much work to do if we're going to shore up the foundations of our democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, that actually is, you know, can can have some, well, I feel like there's a segue from each uh, chapter um, into the next. And uh, I will say that one of the interesting challenges I had in in putting the book together was trying to figure out what chapters would go in what order. Um, because all these pieces feed each other, which I think probably uh, everybody here can already see how each conversation informs the next. And certainly if you check out the book, if you just even look at the table of contents, you'll see that each one can connect. Um, <clears throat> I will, I'll speak about mine just briefly, my chapter, um, which, um, you know, I, I ask a fundamental question of, uh, you know, about asking is, is there a way forward? Um, which again, sort of ending on that point that uh, Andy Perlman was making, um, you know, I, I think about, you know, where where are we going? Are we in in the calm um, eye of the storm? Um, what can be done to bring about change? And uh, I am certainly an, an optimist by nature, but also a realist. And I I certainly see the points that Andy and Kim and Kevin were making, and I think that's just really important. Um, and what I what I try to do in my chapter is just say. What can we do to move forward? How do we engage as a society? And ask, um, you know, for us to think about some of our universal values for how we treat each other. Something which I try to do here at, <clears throat> at Villanova Law is, is every day I talk about how we treat each other with, with respect. I refer to our university's uh, motto, which is veritas, unitas, caritas, as we, we translate to truth, unity, and love. And we are in pursuit of truth. We are in community, and we ask everybody to treat each other with with love. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Act with love and respect for each other, and that's to me just very important. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, what what are we going to do to to find a way to look to our better selves and to act? in a way that shows that we respect each other as brothers and sisters instead of a, a left versus a right, a, 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 you know, a northerner versus a southerner, a Democrat versus a Republican, whatever it happens to be, that we find ways to treat each other differently as opposed to trying to find the common ground. I think it's very hard to do that. But in my, in my chapter, in my you know, fervent belief, we have to make that effort to try to look to each other and say, <clears throat> where, is, where is our common humanity? Where is our common ground? And I think you can you can put these things into the context of you know where I am at Villanova. We are a Catholic Augustinian institution. Um, we can say this is values of a Catholic institution. Um, we can say that they're values of a, of of anybody, frankly, truth, unity, and love. I mean, who who opposes that? You know, if you you you, you can be a, a a Buddhist, a Quaker, a Jew, a Muslim, a atheist, agnostic. We learn values from our our family. We learn values from our houses of worship. We learn values so many places. And so truth, unity, and love, I think, is important for us to try and find some way to have common ground. Because I think what one of the challenges, and I think that everybody really spoke about this. Um, I'm looking back at my notes on Kim was talking about how we got to where we are. Right? That's that's one of the questions. How do we get to where we are? And I think that's that's a, sort of a division we have seen that we have been drifting, drifting far apart. And, and part of that has been the political separation. Part of that was the pandemic. The pandemic literally put us into our separate places. We couldn't be together. You know, it's, it's, you know when you're sitting there with somebody else, you talk to them, it's a lot easier to find that common ground and not just an agreement, but just say, understand this is another person. Maybe we disagree. But when we are separated by distance and screens, it's even even more possible. So I'm I'm trying to find like you know to to get to that question of how do we get to where we are, and that's I think just one of the key questions that that Kim asked. I think also part of what Andy was asking I would connect to mine, in that we're thinking about things which are lawful and unlawful, 
And so we do have those kinds of divides, but I also think like sort of what's what's right? What are the norms? So there may be norms that may be lawful, um, but there's there's still a question of what's the right thing to do? You know, there's not a law that says that the press secretary or the president must speak about true facts as opposed to alternate facts, as was stated. Um, there's not a there's not a law that says the president uh, the, the losing presidential candidate must put forward a concession speech. It's not, you know, it's not a law that the outgoing president must attend the inauguration of the incoming. But these are all things we do to try to make sure we keep moving forward together. So the more we can try to be together, my thought is, is the better we can, better off we can be. Now, in that context, to, to bring it forward into the present day, we've been trying I know we all are trying in our own ways. And here at Villanova, one thing which I have done is I, I started something which we call our Building Bridges Initiative. And the idea is how do we build bridges between people? That to me is essential. So um, we recently had an event um, and, and uh, Jim has just popped it into the, uh, into the chat uh, where, where I invited two former senators, uh, Kelly Ayotte, who's one of our alums, Republican from New Hampshire, and Russ Feingold, a Democrat from uh, Wisconsin. And we got together just to talk, to talk about how they built bridges, how they made things happen during their time in public life, and how we collectively, and certainly in our community, students, faculty, staff, alumni, we're all attending, how we can do something to build bridges for going forward, how we can find some, some way moving ahead. Um, and, and the Building Bridges event to me was, was, uh, was joyous um, because we, we confronted the reality that we are very divided in many ways. And, and this, um, this panel, this discussion is really looking at that question, but also looked at how we might be able to do something going forward. And so in that context, I think that we, that's something we are doing concretely here. I think we're all doing in our classes. And, and I would say as my last point, that's what I'm hoping, and that's what I said in, in my speech at the annual meeting, that we all need to look for ways for us to defend democracy. And we can do it in our teaching, in our scholarship, and in our culture, our community. So, so that's something where I would, would at least ask everybody, how do you, in your classroom, teach these things which Andy and Kim and Kevin so eloquently spoke about? These things, and I, I thought, you know, and Kevin's just talking about, you know, our commitment um, to teaching students to marshal facts and apply the rule of law. You know, Kim talking about students, we want them to be critical consumers of the law. How do we teach our students? That's one of the questions. Then in our scholarship, how do we speak to these important, uh, you know, these important norms and rules and laws? And and, and it's partly what, what Andy's speaking about, but how do we in what we do in our scholarship, do something about this. And that's, all of us are part of this system. So how do we speak about the importance of, of the rule of law, the importance of, of our democracy? And then finally, in our culture, in, in each of us, and, and that's the culture of this, the law school community, which of course informs the greater legal community, um, the bar and the bench. So in that context, I ask and I challenge everybody to find a way within the law school Get out there and tell folks the, the things that matter to you as, as a professor for creating a stronger society. And, it's, and, and none of this, I guarantee you, none of this is about being a Democrat or a Republican or left, right, or progressive, conservative. You can put any labels, liberals, whatever you want to say. This is about how we defend our democracy. And we know that's a very important challenge. We know that Ben Franklin said it's a democracy if we can keep it because it requires work. The preamble talks about forming a more perfect union. We're not going to be perfect. We will never be perfect. And I think that's part of Kim's points. There's hard conversations we just have to take on sometimes. We might not get easy resolutions. We won't be a perfect union, but we can be more perfect every day. And that's the effort that as president of ALS, I ask all of us to engage in. So... Um, so with that said about my chapter and the previous uh, comments from uh, from Kevin and Andy and Kim, um, let me just turn to some some questions. Um, 
Uh, I'll start with you, Andy, for a second. Uh, it's just so many, so many thoughts and never enough time. But um, you know, your I guess a question that you touched on um, the rules of professional conduct. Let's just stay there. Um, is there a revision? You you touched on that in your in your intro comments, but is there a revision you think that we need? Um, and if not, then how do we deal with the fact that we have you have identified that people do things that you do not think are good, uh, terrible uh, things that you were speaking about? So, um, but what do we what do we do about that? Or is there a, is there a change in the rules? My initial reaction when I was starting to write the chapter is that yeah, we should have some new rule that addresses the kind of conduct that we saw from lawyers. And at the end of the day, I concluded that it may be more counterproductive than helpful. So I, I think the solution to the problem that I, ident I identified of lawyers uh, engaging in deceitful and dishonest uh, remarks about, for example, a presidential election, the way to go about it is not through discipline. Uh, we need other strategies, uh, including some that we have deployed, including speaking out publicly, including educating uh, people about civics and, and understanding facts. But at the end of the day, my conclusion was that the problems here are so much deeper and broader than individual lawyers who lie that we need, if we're going to address this problem and keep the democracy, that we need to think in much more systemic ways than tinkering with the rules of professional conduct. Excellent. Um, and, I, and I should just add one, one yeah. small additional thought. I actually think the rules of professional conduct and civil procedure rules worked fine in the mm -hmm. litigation surrounding the election. The judicial system resolved the litigation in the ways that it should have been resolved. The disciplinary system is moving forward on those lawyers who overstepped. There were many lawyers who represented Donald Trump and worked in the government at that time who did their jobs. Some of them withdrew from representing uh, the president in the litigation, uh, and those in government, for the most part, did what they were supposed to do. So I actually don't think that this is a matter of legal ethics. I think the issues we face are, as I mentioned earlier, much deeper and broader. Right. Um, let me let me turn from there over to a common thread with Kevin and Kim. Um, and you know, there's there's the both your chapters. Um, you talk about race, um, and you know we know that January sixth, there are so many ties to white supremacy, um, and uh, those who would would sympathize in in a a vision of our our country as a um, you know, I guess as a, a white Christian nation, they may define it as such. I'm not sure how we exactly define this. We actually have a great chapter in the book by Rob Vischer um, about Christian nationalism. Brilliant chapter there also. Um, but think about um, if if you could each, and I'll, I'll turn it to, to Kim and then to Kevin. Um, how how do we address these questions of, of white supremacy um, race and racism more broadly in the context of, of what happened? Well, I mean, I think as a starting point that we have to acknowledge these things, right? I mean, it, for instance, uh, um, you know, on January 6th, there were people walking through Congress with Confederate flags, right? And, and the idea that people continue to make these claims about, no, 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 it's not, it's not racist. Right. It's just us embracing our history. Right. Um, the Confederate flag had never been walked through the halls of Congress ever. Right. Um, until January 6th. So I think and this is sort of what I was talking about when I was talking about teaching our students to be critical consumers um, of the law. You know, as I am teaching students, um, you know, about these you know, eugenic statutes and where these things are coming from. They are deeply rooted in the racism that was as much a part of the founding of this country as anything else, right? As any language about freedom or liberty or all these other sorts of things, um, racism was completely a part of that. 
Um, and I don't think that we can shy away from that. And I don't think that we can pretend like the world is so different now that it doesn't matter where these laws came from. It doesn't matter what their history is. Um, and particularly as we sit in a time where, and again, I'm a reproductive justice scholar. And so I have spent a, a, an absolutely ridiculous amount of time thinking about writing about talking about Dobbs um, since Dobbs came down. But the ways in which history was manipulated for the purpose of being able to overrule Roe versus Wade and Dobbs, um, one is infuriating, but it also says to us that when we pretend that we can simply construct history in order to fit our, our vision um, of where we want to go, um, that we actually find ourselves moving backwards instead of being able to move forward. Thank you. Uh, Kevin. No, I, I think um, it, it is important to um, acknowledge the role of race in our history. Um, and it, 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 as Kim is mentioning, it's important to acknowledge race in our present. Uh, and I think that many people, uh, and we as educators can, can help remedy this, uh, think of racism as a historical artifact that no longer affects our, our country. Um, or no longer is as blatant as it once was. And, and I think that um, January 6th um, uh, tells us that racism is vibrant in our society, unfortunately. Uh, we should pay attention to it. And one of the things we did here, um, and it also coincided with, sadly enough, with the, the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and you know, regular um, killings of African Americans is we instituted a, a racial justice speaker series to get our community talking about these issues. Uh, it's hybrid in person and also uh, online. And it's not just limited to crime. Uh, it includes and not just limited to African Americans. It's multiracial uh, and multi subject matter oriented. Um, we've had the president of MALDEF talk uh, we've had a local mayor dealing with a, a killing of an African American in Sacramento talk. Um, we, we've had people talk of, you know, from, from the business side of things. And the idea is to, to educate students as well as our community about sort of the broad reaches of racism in modern times. Uh, and it also comes at a time when many students are demanding um, more critical race theory and other um, teaching about racial subordination in schools. Uh, so I view the entire moment from, you know, sadly, from killings of African Americans to January 6th is a time to open up a discussion of this. And I, I do think that um, many um, people um, um, who hold views like the, the Proud Boys who were convicted understand the connection between critical race theory and what they're espousing. Uh, Pre President Trump knew, for example, that what he stood for and what people um, responded to in his messages oftentimes were racial messages. And he attacked critical race theory, directed the Office of Management and Budget to remove it and make sure that we not fund any teaching of critical race theory uh, of, of federal employees. Uh, and this uh, has had incredible impacts through to the present where you have states uh, now trying to bar critical race theory uh, from, from classrooms, including university classrooms. Um, and I think the, the understanding is that critical race theory, which teaches about systemic racism and the history of racism, as well as the modern incarnation of racism, is antithetical to what white supremacists believe. Now, one of the things Kim mentioned is incredibly important. Um, one of the good things about this attack on critical race theory uh, is now lots of people have heard about critical race theory in ways that they never heard about critical race theory previously. Um, and uh, it's, it's amazing to me uh, I, I've had you know, the Davis School District call me up and ask me, what is this critical race theory stuff that we're allegedly teaching? Uh, and I don't know anything about it. Uh, do we have to eliminate our racial justice class from our high school curriculum? Uh, things like that. And I think 
it is amazing how school boards across the country have targeted critical race theory when, uh, for the most part, uh, both the, 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 the attackers and many of the districts accused of spreading these, these views don't know what critical race theory is. Uh, it, it's, it, it's really caught fire and got critical race theory on the front page of many newspapers when in, in you know 10 years ago or five years ago, nobody knew what critical race theory was for the most part. So, so I, I do think that um, we have an education um, you know, program that, that we need to engage in. And there's a lot of work to be done uh, and, and we should, should think about that. But I, I do think um, maybe it's the conspiracy theorist part of me, but I, I do think that you know, the, the, the killing of African-Americans, uh, January 6th, the attacks on critical race theory, they're all related. Um, th thanks to both of you for those. And let me follow up and also partly build on a question that, that was coming from our, our um, Q and A. Um, and the, the question fundamentally is when, you know, when has America been better? Um, the, the, the author says, you know, it is now more out in the open, but the unethical illegal behavior of America has always existed. Um, and, and the point is that, you know, those, those in power will want to, um, the, the question is, you know, those in power will allow America to rot to maintain racism. Um, so I think I think there's a question that what what we all know, and this is, I think, one of our challenges and, and sort of to, to Kevin's point, um, both your points, but, you know, we we have a history and um, the, the reality is um, that it's things which we don't, you know, we don't look back on with great pride in so many ways, some some parts of it, um, but it is true. You know, it is true that slaves were held, um, you know, in the 1619 project, which is, you know, it documents that, you know, I guess we are in, you know, 400 plus years since 1619. It documents a reality. That doesn't mean that today everyone is a racist or everyone wants to hold slaves or things like that. And I think that's the thing which is which is tricky when we talk about critical race theory. One of the things which I always thought was so great about being going to law school and being a law professor is teaching students to think critically. And, and so I think that, that what we, you know, we have a situation where indeed there are, are long, there's a long history of us and, and our better and lesser angels. Um, and so I, I guess that's just sort of the question is um, to the extent that we have better and lesser angels throughout history, um, is there a particular way we, we can or should uh, address that, which I, I'm happy for either uh Kim or Kevin to address that. And then I would actually turn it to Andy because, because you talk about um, the better and lesser angels, so to speak, in, in our legal profession um, and to think about how we, we deal with, with that um, question and, and sort of asking like, are, are we making progress as a profession? So I, I turn to either uh, Kim or Kevin, whoever wants to, to talk and then, and then over to, to Andy. I'll go Kim or I can go, I don't care. Um, I'll just I'll just say one thing really quickly, which is, you know, when when uh, Trump was running and he had this whole, you know, make America great again slogan. And I know that I and, and lots of other folks, um, our response to that was when exactly was that right? I mean, what what moment was it when um, we could say America was just a great, great place, certainly not a great place for everybody. Um, so I think it's a you know, it's a really challenging question to ask. Um, because we have we have failed to live up to the promises of our founding documents from day one, right? Um, and that's that's the work that that remains. Um, and the thing that sort of gives me hope um, is I see you know like folks from Gen Z who are getting elected, um, you know, sort of think about as awful as what happened in the Tennessee um, legislature was, right? We, we we are seeing who the rising stars are, um, and these are folks who are collecting power. Um, and who are wielding it in really important ways. And that gives me at least a glimmer of hope about where we're headed. Great, thank you. Uh, Kevin, it looks like you wanna add something and then we'll turn it to Andy. I think that's right. I mean, history is jagged and some things are better than they were yesterday. Some things are worse than they were yesterday. 
Uh, I, I tend to agree with Dr. King is that pen, things tend to, to, to move in a positive direction oftentimes, but not always in a positive direction. I, and I think we as scholars and teachers should strive to use your and Lincoln's phrase, encourage students to pursue their better angels uh, and to try to do our best to uh, recognize history, uh, question the present, uh, and, and, and also, you know, it's always possible to be nihilistic, you know, um, but it's also amazing if we look at what positive has happened in the last 50 years in, in terms of the recognizing, you know, of um, a gay marriage, which uh, is, is uh, shocking to me. And if you put me into my 1990 self, I would have said very unlikely. Um, uh, trans awareness, even though some of the recent news is truly horrible uh, in the attacks. And actually I'm shocked by the vitriol out there. Um, and, but but, but we're, we're, we're talking about things that we weren't talking about just a few years ago and recognizing legal rights uh, in ways we, 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 we didn't previously. At the same time, as Kim mentioned, um, we see what happened in the Supreme Court in the Dobbs case uh, and if we look at reproductive rights, we were probably better off uh, two years ago than we are today, uh, which just shows you that history doesn't always go on an upward trajectory. Um, but I, I, I think that um, it, it's important that we um, continue to be critical and teach critical thinking uh, and um, call things as we see it and encourage our students to think about things in that way. Thank you. And so sort of moving this this theme of of better angels, lesser angels, and you know how um maybe to to narrow even the question, Andy, um, you know, how has the legal profession as a whole protected or undermined democracy? Um, and how do we as law schools uh address these kinds of problems that led to to January 6th? Yeah, I'm glad you came to me last because <laughs> it's a really hard set of questions to answer. You know, I do think that the issues facing the legal profession do tie into the larger structural developments that both Kim and Kevin were alluding to. I mean, in some ways, and coming back to the original question that was posted, we are certainly in a better place than we have been at various points in our history. But we can simultaneously acknowledge that but also see that we have new kinds of threats that are facing that we're all facing and that pose real challenges for our democracy going forward. Uh, they may or may not be worse than the threats that we have faced in the past, but because they're new kinds of challenges, it's really hard to say for sure how serious they're going to be. So to no doubt that we are better in many respects but the ways in which we're not are still problematic. Now, coming to your question about the legal profession, I, uh, it's a it's kind of a, an example of that larger phenomenon. In many ways, the legal profession and the judicial system have held up remarkably well under the weight and stresses that were placed on it over the last few years. Um, even though many of us can disagree with various decisions on, on, on uh, different issues, on the structural question of the functioning of our democracy, especially around the, the litigation relating to 2020, the judiciary did its job and the legal profession for the most part also did its job. And I think we can take pride in how those issues were resolved while at the same time recognizing that the system is under enormous stress, not only because of these kinds of issues that are percolating in our courts, but what worries me in a very profound way is the public's growing distrust of how these issues are resolved, a growing distrust in the conclusions that courts reach and viewing those decisions in very nakedly political terms is ultimately quite dangerous, not just for the judicial system, but for our democracy as a whole. So those, those problems are... I'm not, I'm not sure they're necessarily different in kind from what we've seen in the past, but they are quite worrisome. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Andy. Um, yeah, and it's interesting. We're getting we're getting a mix of um, look look where you've gone, but what's still worrisome? And I guess that's that is that is part of our challenge. Um, 
uh, let me uh, go to a question. Um, one question was put forward. Um, that is, how do we build bridges to persons who actively undermine democracy? Um, and I will I will take that um, first, since I did speak specifically about our, our own Building Bridges initiative. Um, and um, I don't know who that person is. It's, a, it's an anonymous question, but um, it's hard is the answer. Um, and every day, Every day, I think we just have to we we and I think we have a particular role. Not not just that we're four deans, but you know all folks here. These this is a group of law professors. We have the opportunity to try to show how we can build bridges by engaging in honest discourse and never shying away from disagreement. Um, you know, as as Kim was, you know talking about the uncomfortable conversations you have to have. Um, that's, you know, it's easy to say, much easier to say than to do. Um, but I think that, you know, we we build bridges. And I think that the reality is we are in a very difficult period in our time um, in terms of that question. Um, but I think, honestly, it starts, you know, on such a, uh, an individual scale. Um, it starts in the context of, of you and your your you know the person in the next office from you you and a student with whom you disagree finding two students who you know are you know not getting along over something and, and you know what ask them to to sit down and have a coffee with you and just to talk and you might discover there's just something that you you know that the two students they had no idea that they both had in common um you know who knows what it could be um you know they they both used to go um, to the to the same church once upon a time. They both play baseball when they were kids. They both have parents whose names are John or who knows what it is, random things. But there's a point in which we all can try to see the humanity in each other. But I, I firmly believe it does take us, us as everyone, you know, in, in the, 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 you know, this is an ALS conference. All of us in the work we do to try to make that concerted effort to train our students. And, and I think that if we each do it in our schools, then that's one, that's our little corner of the world. And then that can extend out into, you know, frankly, across our campuses and show some of the, the undergraduates how we can engage. Then we can show other lawyers, other judges, we can show that. It is not easy, um, but I think, you know, building, building it is, is one step at a time. Well, uh, I think the 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 very hard part for me is that um, I am not so old as to be thinking about times back, you know, we're talking about the 1619 project. No, you know, I, I think about times in my life where I grew up in Washington, DC, and my family was very involved in politics. And we had dear friends for, you know, for all of our holidays, for you know, regular dinners, um, hanging out together, summer vacations. There were Democrats and Republicans, um, and there would be, you know, you know, heated debates. But you know, at the end of the day, my parents would always say, "Say goodbye, give a hug and a kiss to Uncle So and So, Aunt So and So," because we treated everybody with love and respect. And I think we found it as a society harder to do that. And I think that truly, that's that is not a an era that's that long ago. But I don't think it's also an era that we can't reclaim. Um, but it just takes, I think, individual work um, one one at a time to 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 get to that. Um, can I can I follow up on that? Yes, really please, quickly? Kim. Please. Um, um, so I was I was listening to a podcast the other day, it's one of Adam Grant's podcasts, and he was talking to um, Tara Westover, who wrote the book Educated, which if you haven't read it, you you must. Um, and she is a woman who was raised um, in a um, very isolated family. Um, and she didn't have any formal education until she managed to go to BYU to college and then ultimately ended up at Oxford. I mean, it's an extraordinary story. But she was talking about this idea of, you know, how do you change people's minds? And she uh, related this anecdote, this story about her life where when she was um, at Oxford, uh, you know, she was at a bar one night and, and, and because in large part of the way that she had been raised, um, she had these really awful ideas about gay people, just deep, deep um, homophobia, just horrible. 
Um, and she said something and there was a woman in the bar who said, oh, I can't even talk to you. You know, you're so disgusting and sort of walked away. But there was another person there who whose basic response was, you seem like a really nice person. And so I'm going to try to understand why you think this way. And just engaged in this long conversation with her that was not accusatory, um, that was really sort of trying to get at why, why do you think this way? Um, and as a consequence of that, was ultimately able to get her to really <laughs> rethink um, literally everything that had been shoved into her head um, when she was younger. And I make you know no claim that I am capable of being such a person, right, and engaging in that kind of work. Um, but it was a really powerful story. And I think that there is something, you know, those one-on-one -on -one interactions where the conversation is not about why you're such a horrible person because you think X, Y, or Z, but you're probably not a horrible person. And so let's try to have a conversation about why you're there and I'm here. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, let me, wow, time is flying by. Let me... Um, let me ask a question. I'll, I'll start with uh, Andy and then let uh, Kevin and or Kim also talk. Um, but in light of in light of the lessons that we learned from uh, 2020 election from January 6th, um, how how do we how does legal education need to evolve um, or if it doesn't, then why not? I've been thinking a lot about this and have engaged even our faculty in some conversation about what more we could be doing. And it's not an easy question to answer in a way that people will perceive as nonpartisan. Um, one, one opportunity is I think our students are arriving with a serious lack of basic civics education. And maybe that's just a product of our educational process and what's being taught in schools. But I am sometimes rather surprised at how little students know about some central features of democracy and how it all works and what role lawyers play in all of it. I, I do wonder whether law schools have a role to play in that regard. I also think about the lawyer leader roles that many of our graduates go on to serve in and how we can better prepare them to play those roles with integrity and in ways that ultimately support rather than undermine democratic norms. I'm not exactly sure what that looks like. Uh, some schools have specific leadership related courses or paths, but it's something that I think we need to consider. And then the final possibility is for law schools to join together in a consortium of some kind where we work together on issues relating to democracy. Uh, because I do think that there's a lot more that we can do together than any of us can do on our own. And we have established some models for that in recent years. I'm part of a, a group of deans who got off the ground, uh, something called the ABA uh, Legal Education Consortium on Police Practices, where after George Floyd was murdered, a bunch of law schools got together and say, hey, I, there, there may be something we can do here collectively that we wouldn't be able to achieve on our own. It'd be useful, I think, for law schools to think in similar terms about how we protect democratic norms. So I, I, I hope that's a conversation that mm -hmm. can continue in the years to come as well. Great. Thank you. Kevin? I think we should continue the, the types of strategies that you, Mark, for example, have engaged in. You know, I would refer to it as modeling respectful dialogue and discussion. Um, and it's something that deans have a lot of practice in, uh, I guess, because, um, and I found, I'll speak for myself, uh, st students often will come in with demands uh, faculty will sometimes come in with demands. One of the things I always try to do is, you know, I, I will treat you respectfully. I, I will tell you what I think. Uh, I really want you to treat me respectfully and have a discussion of these things. Uh, and uh, I sometimes say just like that, because um, sometimes the antagonism just, uh, I guess we teach the adversarial process very well. Um, because it, it, it certainly sticks with people. But, but I, I, I do think it's important to uh, do your best, do our best, not just deans, but faculty, to model good 
behavior when it comes to disagreement and exchange of ideas in the classroom and with each other uh, and with, with others. It, it also um, is a more effective way of persuading people and advocacy than uh, telling people that they're um, not well informed um, or something like that. So I, I, I do think that's important. I, and I also think, I don't think major changes in legal education promoting democracy are, are necessary, um, but I do think it's worth highlighting the things that, that we know. Uh, and the rule of law, as Andy mentioned, in some ways um, worked uh, when it came to January 6th, and it's worked in some instances uh, of police violence, and it's, it's worked in certain respects. Um, I mean, if you compare um, what happened in, in the criminal prosecutions of, of the police in George Floyd to what happened in LA with Rodney King, just very different outcomes. Uh, and, and, and I think that, you know, in some ways, rule of law can work at times. It doesn't always work, and it can be disappointing and heartbreaking at times. Um, but, but highlighting where it does work uh, and where, what we need to do to improve it uh, and having discussions, uh, the, the, there may be disagreement. There often will be disagreement. Um, but, but I do think, um, it, it, as Kim mentioned, um, individual discussion, and Mark mentioned too, the individual discussions can be make all the difference, individual respectful discussions. I remember talking years ago, met my, um, when I first met my, my um, um, wife's grandfather, a Mexican-American man from in Arizona, uh, he was talked, we somehow got in a discussion of the death penalty and he, he was all um, in favor um, and I'm not. Um, and, um, uh, and I said, you know, the, the, first, the first people they're gonna go after in Arizona are Mexican-Americans, you know that, don't you? Uh, and he, he, he looked at me and he said, and he had suffered discrimination his entire life, including not being able to use public pools and, 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 and the like. And he said, yeah, I think, got me thinking. Um, and maybe he didn't change his mind, but he was thinking. Uh, and I think that's what we can hope for. Well, and I, I think, um, you know, your, your phrasing there, you know, modeling respectful behavior, um, you know, I think the way you said it is so important. Um, you know, it's, if 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 any of us think somebody is not well informed, we have a decision to make. Um, we can say something negative to that person. This is kind of like Kim's story, right? We can say you are whatever. I don't like you because you're not well informed. Again, we can use different language. We can say I'm not going to talk to you. I'm going to cancel you. I'm going to hate you. Or we can say maybe I can inform you. Maybe I can provide that different level. And, and again, that's, that's a challenge these days. But I think that's a choice which we make. That's a choice. I also would just say that um, talking about civics, Anthony Crowell um, from New York Law School, he has a great chapter about civics in, in this book. I'm, I'm going to plug every chapter in this book if I haven't done so already. Um, and um, and I would say now we actually, I the, like all the conversations we had throughout the creation of this book, um, we would have uh, get togethers of us uh, talking about our progress on the book uh, periodically while we were writing this um, flies by, time simply flies. So we're, um, I would say if, if you can, um, in 30 seconds or less, give us last words just as we, as we try to wrap it up. Um, I guess I went... I'll go reverse alphabetical since I went alphabetical the first time by last name. There are so many more things we could talk about. Um, there's there's questions um, which we haven't been able to get to, but we are running short on time. So Andy Perlman, then Kim Mutcherson, then Kevin Johnson, 30 seconds if you could. Yeah. Uh, sobering challenges ahead, but I remain optimistic. And one idea that just occurred to me in hearing the great ideas about how we need to talk across difference what if law schools from different parts of the country were to arrange for students from their respective schools to talk to each other, maybe coordinated by the AALS, uh, we'd be able to bridge geographic differences uh, and ideological differences in ways that are exciting and potentially helpful in the long run. So just one very practical idea that maybe we can take with us. Great. Thank you, Andy. Kim. Um, 
I, you know, I, I think one of the things that can be um, really challenging, particularly if you are a person um, with, you know, particular identity, identity categories working in spaces where there aren't lots of people who look like you, um, is feeling like you have to take on this burden, right? And I don't want people to feel um, burdened. Um, but having said that, um, you know, I I am just thrilled that I have been able to be a law school dean at a time when there are more women, more women of color, more people of color in general um, than there have ever been um, at, at law schools. And I just think that's tremendous. And so one of the things that I really um, want people to do is to sort of live in their truth. I think that's that's so important for students to see. Um, you know, all these different sorts of folks who are able to have positions of power and who use those positions of power. This is one of my favorite quotes um, from Ayanna Presley um, talking about the work that she does. And she said, I'm not here just to take up space. I'm here to create it. Um, and so I hope that those of us who have these positions are using them to create space for our students, for other faculty, for other deans, um, because it's 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 creating those spaces where lots of people are sometimes forced to interact with each other. Um, that I think brings us into the conversations that we need to be having. Great. Thank you, Kim. Kevin? Uh, I'll, I'll be brief. I, I do think it, it's fair to say that um, these have been tough times, you know, a pandemic, uh, a, a, a insurrection, um, mass violence that seems to be on TV every day. Um, it, at the same time, uh, it's a great time to be in legal education where things have been changing. Uh, there's pressures on us to change more. And there's a lot of exciting things going on. Uh, and what we need is visionary faculty and leaders uh, to, to help move us in to, to the future. And there's, there's a lot of good that can be done uh, and a, a lot of hard work that has to be done, uh, but it's not um, all is lost time. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, great perspective. Um, thanks, thanks to the three of you. Um, also, really, truly, thanks to the ten other folks who were uh, on this book with us. And some have returned since that time. Some have returned to faculty positions. Some have become uh, college presidents. Um, some have switched their their schools. Um, but we all are committed to this this bigger project. Um, I do encourage all of you to. Uh, who are watching, take a look um, at the book um, and reach out to any of us um, who are co-authors, um, because I think we all are committed to this. We are deeply committed. And the fact that you are here today, uh, spending your time um, on this, uh, paying attention on this panel, I am, I'm grateful for you. And I think that means you want to be part of, of this uh, project as well. Um, so please be in touch with all of us. Uh, please keep up the good work. Um, we are going to take a break uh, for uh, till about one o'clock Eastern, ten o'clock Pacific, um, and um, we will look forward to you uh, continuing the work that we're all doing. Thank you for joining us. Take care. <laughs>